as he's got some business to attend to. So I'm going to be introducing today's event. We're very pleased to welcome you tonight to, to tonight's webinar co-presented between Orienteering Ontario and Orienteering Canada. And thank you very much for attending. Um, both the turnout for this event and the one we held in April has been fantastic and it's very exciting for us to see that going. Uh, just a quick note, this session is being recorded for future reference. Uh, you should have got that note just now uh, when that was turned on. Uh, so for an, an land acknowledgement, we would like to start this event by expressing our appreciation for ha in having the opportunity to gather as a community by respecting and acknowledging and acknowledging the First Nations, Indigenous, Inuit, and Métis peoples of Canada as the keepers of the territory upon which each of us will be meeting and learning on today. I would like to begin by thanking Orienteering Canada to provide a platform uh, to present this webinar, as well as to our clubs for promoting this to their members. And we're especially thrilled to see, you know, more new names and more people coming out to these events from uh, across the country, it's awesome. And we're hoping to see more participants even um, in, the, in future events. So today's webinar is called Orienteering for the Brain, an activity to help in, improve cognitive functioning and will be presented by Emma Waddington, who is a proud member of the Don't Get Lost or Orienteering Club here in Southern Ontario and Team Canada. She is a graduate student supervised by Dr. Jennifer Heights in the Department of Kinesiology at McMaster University in Hamilton, where she also completed her undergraduate degree and began her research on orienteering and brain function. Many of you know the name Waddington um, in the orienteering community. Emma has been an athlete on the national orienteering team since 2015 and is an active member with Don't Get Lost and the Adventure Running Kids program. And she was the first graduate to race for Canada. Uh, I'm assuming the first graduate of the Adventure Running Kids program. But anyway, um, some of her notable race results include sixth place in the 2018 World Juniors Championship Sprint and eighth in the 2018 World University Champs Sprint, as well as winning Canadian and North American titles. She's also the daughter of Mike Waddington, who presented here last month. In tonight's webinar, Emma will discuss the impact of exercise on brain health and how training our brain using navigational tasks may benefit cognitive function. Emma will also discuss recent research from the McMaster NeuroFit Lab, led by Emma and supervised by Dr. Heights, the Canada Research Chair in Brain Health and Aging at McMaster University on how using exercise and particularly orienteering may help us stave off age-related cognitive decline. And now with that, I will turn the virtual floor over to Emma. Questions, uh, feel free to pop them into the chat and Jeff Teutsch or myself will take care of that. So Emma, it's off to you. Thank you, Amber. Uh, thank you for a great introduction. I think uh, Nevin uh, put that together very well for you, very last minute. <laughs> yes, that was great. Thank you. I hope I said everything right. You nailed it. Very good. <laughs> uh, awesome. Well, I'm super happy to uh, be doing this webinar today. Um, we're going to be in this webinar learning about the effects of exercise on brain health and function through our beloved sport orienteering. So, uh, Amber went through a very nice introduction, but I'll, I'll debrief that a little bit again. Um, my name is Emma, like I said, I'm a second year master's student in kinesiology at McMaster University. In the NeuroFit lab, I work with my supervisor, Dr. Jennifer Heiss, in, in the field of exercise cognition. And this is where we try and answer questions like, how can we improve cognitive functioning through exercise? And I'm really fortunate to be able to combine my research and my athletic interests in one holistic uh, research project, um, and that is through orienteering. So like Amber said, I've, uh, I'm a graduate of the Don't Get Lost Adventure Running Kids program, um, where I joined the national team in 2015. But besides orienteering, I'm uh, becoming a little bit more involved now in adventure racing. Uh, so you can see here a nice picture of uh, after my first 24 hour, 24 hour adventure race uh, featuring my dad. Um, super fun. So that's a little bit about me. 
Um, so let's let's hop into the content. In the field of exercise cognition, there's a lot of different terms. So I'm going to define a few of them before we get started so that we're all on the same page. So this field of research tries to answer questions like I preluded to before, how can we improve cognitive functioning through exercise? So there's two parts here. Exercise, we're all pretty familiar with this, very structured physical activity. And cognitive functioning refers to a variety of cognitive processes that we use in our everyday lives. So you can see here, uh, perception, learning, memory, understanding, awareness, reasoning, judgment, intuition, and language. So a whole bunch of different processes, but my research focuses specifically on things like memory. But why memory and why do we care about exercise in the first place? Well, we care about ways that um, the brain can be aided through the aging process because in the aging process, the brain is susceptible to degeneration or breakdown. And this is completely normal, it's expected, and it's, this is normal and healthy aging. But in more severe cases, um, the breakdown is, is seen in neurodegenerative diseases or conditions like Alzheimer's disease or in other forms of dementia. And what's notable is that this breakdown is not equal across the brain. In a brain region called the hippocampus, which is responsible for learning, memory, and spatial processing, is really highly impacted more than other regions. And this severe atrophy of the hippocampus, as in conditions like Alzheimer's, can result in uh, impairments in learning and memory, specifically memory for past events. This is called episodic memory, as well as spatial memory. So the memory of places, spatial relationships, that sort of thing. And what's really quite um, prominent is that these impairments in spatial memory can lead to something known as topographical disorientation. And this is where people become easily turned around, even in places that they're really, really familiar with. So this topographical disorientation on top of feelings of loneliness associated with aging can actually accelerate the breakdown of the brain regions like the hippocampus. Um, and that not only further degrades some of the things you mentioned before, learning and memory, topographical, topographical disorientation, but it can also lead to mental health challenges um, that are associated with that loneliness. So overall, a variety of different symptoms that can um, impact the quality of life. And so we want to find ways that we can target these, um, these symptoms. And fortunately, we can do that because the brain is plastic. The brain is malleable, it's changeable. And exercise is one of, if not the best ways to kickstart these beneficial brain changes to then support cognitive function and target some of those symptoms that we just talked about. So there's a lot of ways that the brain can be changed through exercise. So I'm gonna walk through a few examples here and use kind of analogy of cars driving on a road to explain the ways the brain changes um, through exercise. The first way the brain changes is called something through is through something called neurogenesis. Neurogenesis is the creation of new neurons in the brain. Now neurons are like little information messengers and they help transmit information across the brain so that we can do all those cognitive functions that I mentioned earlier. So in our example, these are like cars. So when we um, engage in exercise, we can make new, make, we can make new cars um, to send information around our brain. The next way the brain changes is through creation, creating new synapses. So synapses are like connections. When we learn a new skill, new connections are made in the brain to create a new pathway. So this is kind of like making a new pathway to somewhere you've never been before. The next time that you go um, try to do that task again or go to that place, you'll already have that pathway there for you. The next way the brain changes is through making those synapses that you just made stronger. So when you drive a route a few times in a row, you get better at knowing where to go. And this is like strengthening those neural connections. So essentially, you're building bigger highways through the brain so you can get there more efficiently. Um, and you can get better at doing those cognitive tasks, going through those pathways with time. The fourth way is through weakening synapses that we don't use anymore. So when you have these neural connections that you've strengthened, 
you don't need those ones you don't use anymore. When you have a highway, you don't really tend to use the dirt roads anymore. So the brain can focus on the important pathways and prune away the ones it doesn't use so it becomes more efficient overall. So as we can see, there's a lot of ways that the brain can change throughout the lifespan, and this overall impacts cognitive function. But how exactly does exercise do this? Again, Lisa, ask any questions at any time. And uh, Jeff, maybe if there's a question, maybe just raise your hands because uh, I can see your name down at the bottom of my screen. <laughs> maybe that'd be good. So we'll talk about two, there's a lot of different pathways that go on in the brain, but we'll talk about the most important one. And I think it's the coolest. Um, so when we do aerobic exercise, so things like walking, running, cycling, swimming, something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor or BDNF, gets released into the brain. Now, this BDNF acts like a fertilizer, and it fertilizes the hippocampus region, which we said is responsible for learning and memory, and is often targeted in dementia. Now, this BDNF fertilizer actually stimulates neurogenesis. It helps create new neurons in the hippocampus brain region, and it also helps to proliferate those neurons around the brain to make new connections um, in the hippocampus and then outside of the hippocampus to other related brain structures. So now if we think back to our car analogy, we have more cars and more roads. And so through this pathway, not only does exercise increase the volume of the brain, uh, sorry, of the hippocampus, but it also increases the amount of blood flow to that brain region so that the brain can get enough oxygen to function properly. Because of these changes, this helps support cognitive functions that the hippocampus is responsible for, so learning, memory, and spatial cognition. So in this example, more, more cars, more roads, better cognitive function. Make sense? So we have our exercise pathway. We just went over that, um, leading to cognitive function improvements. But there's actually a way that we could get more bang for our buck in this situation. From a separate but very synergistic pathway to exercise, engaging in cognitive training, so doing things like puzzles, word games, or exploring a new place, can elicit similar cognitive benefits. So cognitive training's pathway works to actually strengthen the synapses of the neural connections that exercise just made. So we have new neurons, we have new connections when we exercise, but when we combine that with cognitive training, those synapses, those connections get strengthened. So now not only do we have more cars and more roads, but those roads are becoming bigger and stronger. And now if you see, we have two pathways here. I don't know if you can see my mouse, um, but our exercise pathway is working on one way to increase cognitive function, but the synergistic effects of cognitive training are going to lead to even greater cognitive gains when we're combining them together because of that synergistic um, com combination of pathways. So let's see how um, this was tested in our research lab. So our lab had um, young adults come into the lab and they did a memory test. Then they were split into three conditions, those who did exercise only, those who exercised and combined it with the cognitive task, and those who did not perform any exercise. For those who were exercising, they did so in a high intensity manner uh, three times a week for six weeks. Then after those six weeks, they completed another memory test to see who improved the most in their memory. Now, in this study, it was really interesting. Um, the researchers found that there were some participants who responded really, really well to the exercise, um, and they were classified um, on the right um, side of the, the bottom axis as high responders to exercise. So after the six weeks, they saw really big gains in their fitness. But they also saw participants who really didn't respond well to the exercise, um, and they were classified as low responders. So that's what those two um, groups there at the bottom will indicate. Then we'll be able to see um, the uh, combined training intervention. So those who exercised um, and did cognitive training at the same time in the dark gray bars and those who did exercise only in the light gray bars.
So after the six weeks of exercise, it was found that those who responded very well to the exercise, the high responders, those who actually engaged in both exercise and cognitive training saw the best increases in memory performance compared to those who exercised alone. But it's really interesting to show how the results were actually the opposite for those who did not respond well to the exercise. And we think this may be because of something called mental fatigue in that um, engaging in exercise is physiologically stressful and engaging in cognitive training is psychologically stressful. And both of those things can compound to maybe um, interfere with that memory performance gains. And I think we have a question, so we will pause for a moment. Yeah, there's a, there's a question from Amber. Hmm. Uh, Amber, would you like to just ask the question yourself? I was gonna let you do the job, Jeff. That's okay, I can ask it. I was just curious, like, so for the, when you call them high and low responders, like, did you actually direct the exercise and or the type? Did you watch them do it? Like, how, how was the exercise done? Um, so this was, uh, I wasn't involved in this study, uh, unfortunately, because mm. it was a really cool one. Um, mm. But this study, they did exercise on a cycle ergometer. So they were in the lab. And those who did the combined exercise, um, they would cycle um, and then I think it was immediately after, I can't remember if it was immediately after or immediately before, they would do a cognitive training task um, and then they would do their cool down and then they would be done. So one of the things that I really think is important when you combine exercise and cognitive training is that you're combining them at the same time. So when they're done simultaneously, um, if you think back to recent evolutionary past, our brains are tuned to tasks like hunting and gathering where you're physically doing locomotion to and using spatial skills like mm. um, navigating and memorizing locations of food and stuff so and now we have gps's and cars and we don't do that anymore so um i really think that perhaps this study could be strengthened um, maybe we wouldn't see as many of these um, differential effects if um the exercise and the cognitive training was done at the same time right Okay, cool. So I don't know if that answers your question, but we can circle back to that uh, at the end if there's more. You're good. Okay. Okay. So um, long story short, we see that uh, engaging in combined training can be really beneficial for the brain. But of course, this was done in young adults. So this is where my study has come into question because I saw combining exercise with cognitive training and I was like, huh, we do that when we do orienteering, do we not? Um, so I was really, really interested in seeing how this would impact cognitive function. And in my study, um, sorry, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. Um, because when we do orienteering, we're engaging in all kinds of mental tasks at the same time, like decision-making, um, there's spatial memory, spatial processing for looking at your map and then into the terrain and seeing if anything matches. Um, and like I just preluded to uh, with Amber's question is that we don't get to use these tasks anymore because we have GPSs and we have cars. Um, so my research question was kind of trying to answer that does orienteering stimulate um, cognitive function in a way that could um, give us an indication to um, kind of decreasing that risk for some of the things you mentioned before, like topographical disorientation or losses in spatial memory. To test this, uh, we had a study where we asked adults of all ages who had never done orienteering but were physically active, as well as people who had done orienteering at an intermediate, advanced, or elite skill level. So we had 158 participants in total, and we essentially gave them an online questionnaire. I think maybe some of you um, in this call tonight may have taken part in this questionnaire, um, so I thank you for that. Um, and we asked them about their spatial memory, their spatial navigation strategies. Uh, so how they approach navigational task. And we wanted to compare between the different skill levels, um, which group uh, was having the highest reports of using those certain um, cognitive functions. So first I'm gonna show you the results from the spatial memory. So this is um, essentially someone's perceptions of their spatial memory abilities. What we found 
was um, you can see each of the four groups controls um, intermediate orienteers, advanced and elite orienteers on the bottom axis. And then essentially a higher score on this graph is indicating better memory perceptions. And what we found was that those in either the advanced or elite level orienteering categories had higher ratings of their spatial memory compared to either the controls or the intermediate orienteers. And it's really important to note that these relationships were held regardless of the age, sex, or physical activity level. So no matter your age, if you have a higher skill in orienteering, you've maybe been doing it longer um, and a little bit more vigorously, that spatial memory can be um, benefited. Now, the results that I think are the most interesting of this study was that we also looked at the navigational strategies that orienteers took compared to those who did not orienteer. And when we navigate, we can use one of three processes or we can kind of interchange between them. The first process is something called egocentric processing. And this is sort of a um, first person view of the world as you're navigating. So you're thinking of yourself moving through a space, looking at objects around you. This takes some spatial skill to acquire, but it's usually maintained throughout the aging process because it does not rely on the hippocampus. So this is a spatial technique that is usually um, saved within the aging process. Um, uh, so usually tended to be used by older adults um, throughout the lifespan. The other way you could navigate is using something called allocentric processing. And this is sort of thinking of um, something from a third person, maybe like a bird's eye view of yourself um, looking down on all of the objects no. um, below you. No. And this type of processing um, usually de deteriorates with age um, because it does rely very heavily on the hippocampus. And sorry, I think someone's microphone isn't muted. Can you please make sure that your microphone is muted? Thank you. Um, and because this allocentric processing relies on the hippocampus, it is often very deteriorated with age and very highly in dementia. The third way you can navigate is using something called procedural processing. And this is a non-spatial approach to navigating. So essentially you're navigating without any spatial information, just remembering a series of landmarks or turns. So maybe like third trail on the left, something like that. This is usually the default way to navigate. But back to our study, we found when we compared those with various skill levels in orienteering, that both orienteers with advanced or elite skill level in orienteering reported using egocentric and allocentric spatial navigation techniques more than either controls or intermediate level orienteers. And what's no interesting on the contrary to that was that those with no orienteering experience or very little actually used those uh, procedural non-spatial navigation techniques to a greater extent. So what we think that these uh, results indicate is that the active rehearsal of looking at your map, which is processing uh, allocentric type of information, and then translating that information into the first person to match up what you see on your map to the real terrain. And then, okay, I see that on the terrain, then I have to update it back to my map to make sure I know where I am. This is active rehearsal. Um, is, is allowing for more desirable navigation strategies. So we're actively using this allocentric uh, processing technique that does tend to decline with age. And because orienteering allows us to naturally do that, they are helping to stave off its decline within the aging process. And again, because we saw these results, regardless of age, sex, or physical activity level. So I think this is a really, really important in that um, we see this allocentric processing taking a really hard hit with aging and in dementia, but orienteering, because of the nature of reading the map and then looking forward into the terrain, it allows us to naturally rehearse this um, cognitive function that takes a hard hit. So obviously the results of this study um, were pretty preliminary, very, uh, very subjective, you know, lots of questionnaires. Uh, but there's also some other uh, researchers taking a look at the effects of orienteering as a training intervention. 
Um, so in this study, they looked at um, what the effects were of 12 weeks of orienteering training done uh, two times a week um, in a progressive difficulty manner. So each week, the training tasks got a little bit harder um, and done so at a moderate intensity exercise, um, moderate exercise intensity. Um, and they compared this to badminton players who um, didn't change their exercise routine. And in this study, what they wanted to do was compare, compare the reaction time to a mental rotation task. So essentially participants were shown a 3D image and were had to uh, respond as quickly as possible to, um, if you were to look at it from the other side, what would it look like? So we can see on the bottom axis here, we have the pre-intervention score. So their reaction time before, and then the post-intervention reaction time. You'll see the experimental group in blue and the control group in the gray. And what they found was that um, after the intervention, reaction time for the mental rotation task for the spatial cognition um, uh, test um, was faster, those in the orienteering group, um, and that was significantly faster than the control group. So really interesting findings there, but this was actually only seen to be significant in male participants in this study. And that brings us back to some kind of evolutionary context is that, um, you know, females kind of uh, were more on the gatherer side of the hunter gatherer uh, recent past, whereas males were more involved in hunting. Um, and because of this, females tend to approach navigational techniques with less of a spatial background. So they're more attuned to using those uh, non-spatial procedural navigation techniques, whereas males are more likely to use cardinal directions, uh, so more of that egocentric kind of uh, approach. And um, it's really interesting to see these findings um, because orienteering is a fairly highly spatial task, and that kind of brings into the question what other roles are going on um, here or what other factors are going on here where we could sort of target um, cognitive function equally um, between uh, males and female participants. And what we're testing right now in the lab, um, I can't share some data with you, I wish I could, uh, but I'll briefly mention some really exciting findings that we're seeing right now, is if right now in our lab, we're testing the effects of exercise intensity in a combined intervention like orienteering. So we have participants um, doing various exercise intensities while orienteering or not orienteering, and we're comparing uh, the effects on their cognition, as well as that brain-derived neurotrophic factor, that kind of fertilizer that I talked about before, um, to see if the exercise intensity um, really matters in um, giving that brain boost uh, following this type, this type of combined intervention. So stay tuned for more very soon. <laughs> Um, and one final study that I'd like to share with you, um, this one is for the super nerds. I don't know if uh, the Catching Features legend uh, Eric Kemp is on the line, um, but this study actually looked at the effects of doing six weeks of a virtual orienteering video game, Catching Features, um, on spatial cognition. So um, here participants um, either played Catching Features or um, were shown a series of 3D images and had to match uh, different perspectives of them. Um, and they actually found that the six weeks of this, uh, <laughs> this video game actually increased the speed of mental rotation on that similar uh, spatial cognition task that we had in the, the previous study. Um, and this actually increased the spatial ability in both males and females. So there's a lot of conflicting results in terms of the effects on the males and females. Um, but I think it uh, shows some cool, cool emerging research on the effects of um, some maybe virtual reality interventions that could be um, used in different populations uh, to increase accessibility to doing tasks like orienteering. Um, and also, but still being able to give some cognitive benefit. So pretty cool, super nerdy study. I was pretty shocked when I found that they actually use catching features in this game. So um, pretty cool. <laughs> um, so that's all the content that I have tonight before we open the floor to some questions. But first, we'll wrap it up with three key points that I want you to take away. 
First, we learned that exercise through that brain-derived neurotrophic factor helps us to fertilize the brain, um, help support its integrity, and thus our cognitive function. We also learned that combining exercise and cognitive training um, may give us a little bit more bang for our buck in staving off cognitive decline um, because it targets two separate but synergistic pathways leading to the same end result. Um, and finally, that orienting may allow us to uh, engage in the active rehearsal of essential neural processes, especially ones that we don't tend to, to use as much in modern life because we have things like GPSs and cars um, in which our recent evolutionary ancestors did not have those. And this might be really important in, um, in terms of interventions that can help stave off uh, cognitive decline. So that's all I have. I'm really happy to answer some questions that you may have. You can throw them in the chat or uh, unmute your microphone. So I have a few questions Emma, yeah. that I wrote down as we get, went along. So Good. Um, in, in terms of exercise, like, do we have an idea of how, how much exercise like are you talking about? So <laughs> what's really interesting is the study we're doing right now is one bout of about 15 minutes of exercise. Um, and we are actually seeing benefits in that brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So there is a, there, we do know that acute exercise, so one dose, um, like not a long intervention, exercise only, that is still very potently able to increase cognitive function through that brain-derived uh, neurotrophic factor pathway. Um, but, you know, long training interventions um are also very beneficial so essentially it's a it's a there's a little bit of a dose response where you know a little bit more is better but still things that are very acute maybe um you know a short high intensity workout really really good at uh, increasing brain brain function all around so and then just one other question um to follow not quite a follow-up sort of uh so you were talking about how you were building uh, stronger synapses and pathways and doing all of that kind of stuff. So is there an understanding or is there any thoughts about what for kids who are still developing all of those brain pathways, like if they're doing exercise, like are you, are they building better brains maybe, or is it not known really? I haven't, I haven't particularly been following a ton of, um, the literature on children or young adults. Um, however, I do know that uh, it's never too late to start and that the brain is plastic throughout the whole lifespan. Mm. So you can develop these new pathways. Obviously, you know, that learning new languages when you're young is, is, is better than when you're older. Um, but in, you know, exercising throughout your lifespan uh, may be beneficial, but we have seen studies that, uh, in terms of cognitive functioning, starting exercise later in life is equally as good. So the brain is plastic throughout the lifespan. So whether I think, you know, engaging it as a young child or as an older adult, it's never too late to start. Um, and a little bit does go a long way. Cool. Thank you. Okay. So awesome. I have a few questions in the chat. I don't know, Jeff, if you want to moderate it, there's a whole <laughs> bunch here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking I would, but but I was actually okay. going to jump in with a with a question of my own first. Okay, because <laughs> um, it's kind of in line with with some of what Amber was was asking about um, in terms of the um, you know the duration of the of the exercise intervention and and my question two parts to it I guess one is um, I'm trying to think how to how to phrase this well so I guess. Does it matter what type of exercise? I'm assuming at this point that the exercises that you've talked about, they're all uh, they're all aerobic forms of exercise. So does it does it matter what type of exercise we're talking about here? Have, have studies been done on strength training, for example? And the other half of that is what is known about the mechanisms of of how this works? 
So yes, there's lots of research on both aerobic and resistance exercise. Um, and what's really cool is that resistance exercise actually works on a separate pathway than aerobic. So um, instead of training or instead of targeting that brain derived neurotrophic factor, that BDNF fertilizer we talked about, it targets another neurotropin. So something similar to BDNF, but it targets slightly different pathways. Um, but that also leads to cognitive function gains. Um, I think a lot of the research on um, resistance exercise is more on the executive functioning kind of thing. So our higher order processing, like decision-making and problem solving. Um, so we see the different exercise types kind of targeting a few different cognitive functions. Um, so interventions that combine both um, are really good for kind of global improvements. Um, and your second path, your second question, there's a ton of different pathways. Um, and most of them are really related to the relationship between the muscle in the body and the brain. So um, one of the things that we're looking at right now is lactate. So I know familiar with lactic acid is when you start to run and you feel awful, you have lactic acid built up in your body. But um, this is because the body can't uh, get up to the exercise intensity as quickly as you want it to. So it makes us lactic acid. And normally the muscles are using glucose to fuel the body, but the brain is also using glucose. And when we have this buildup of lactate, the muscle needs to get rid of that lactate really quickly. So it does so by using glucose. And that means the brain doesn't get enough glucose. So it actually sends the lactate, not the lactic acid, but the lactate molecule up to the brain. And that lactate actually fuels cognitive processes. So it can actually fuel the brain in these situations of high lactic acid. So that's one of the pathways that we're really interested in looking at right now. So maybe feeling awful in your workout isn't so bad. Um, and that's maybe why the high intensity exercise, even just one single one-off bout of intense exercise can really benefit cognitive function. That's Super fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> I thought so too. So I have dedicated <laughs> two years of researching it. <laughs> yes, um, more uh, more than the rest of us are willing to put in. Yeah. Um, um, and there's a, just a quick question on uh, that egocentric and procedural navigation. So egocentric navigation is um, we say, okay, I am going to navigate to the store. And you're thinking, okay, in my real world, I'm going to look up and I'm going to see, you know, the the school and then the church on the right hand corner. Um, and you can see yourself in the first person throughout that terrain. Um, but you're relating yourself to those uh, different spatial elements throughout the world. However, when you're doing procedural navigation, you may still see yourself in the first person. Um, but you're not relating to the, the, the spatial relationships of those elements. You're just thinking, okay, there's the third road. Um, I'm going to turn left at the church. Um, there's no relationship between those, uh, those spatial structures. I hope that maybe answers your question. Um, Emma, if, 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 if I'm jumping in and stepping on your toes, nope. please stop me. But, um, I've heard it described, uh, Egocentric is basically left thinking in terms of left and right. Uh, allocentric is thinking in terms of uh, north, east, southwest. And procedural would be a list of instructions. Yeah. So similarly, yeah. So your your list of instructions, like, you know, uh, if you were to just look at what Google Maps tells you in, in writing, that would be kind of procedural. Um, egocentric, yes, a little bit of left and right, but you're also um, getting some of the, you know, like the the spatial elements in relation to each other. And then the allocentric, yes, you like north, south, east, and west. Um, but the key is that you're kind of, you know, you're watching GPS tracking in a, in an orienteering race. You're seeing those dots moving around. That would be like, okay, I'm looking at those dots traveling around the world, but instead of me looking at the dots, that's how I'm picturing myself moving through a terrain kind of from the top down. Um, looking through the questions here. Uh, at what age does age-related cognitive decline usually begin? So usually we see, um, so, well, I just turned 25. 25 is the age where the brain is now fully developed and 
that's also when the brain starts to decline in function. So we're all kind of declining at uh, a small rate, which is totally normal. And, you know, it's expected. We normally see these declines. We see a little bit of degeneration. Um, usually around the age of 65 to 70 is when we start to see things um, start to increase uh, in the rate of degeneration. And then usually around the ages of 80 is when we usually see that onset of uh, conditions like Alzheimer's disease, um, things like that. But like I said before, the brain is malleable across the lifespan and it's never too late to start. And perhaps engaging in later life uh, would just help prolong um, that time where you get to the severe um, breakdown area. Um, that answered that question. Um, there's one question. Uh, was there a Swedish study that showed or older orienteers had much more cognitive function than non-orienteers? I bet there is. Um, <laughs> Uh, definitely. And I seen, have seen a lot of uh, research on um, kind of some of the uh, what, what uh, kind of strategies that different skill level orienteers take when they do navigation in terms of, you know, where are they looking? How long are they looking? What are they attuning to spatially? Um, but uh, yes, I could pretty, pretty confidently say that uh, older orienteers have likely um, more beneficial cognitive function than non tears. Um, is there anything that women can do now to help us use more of the egocentric, allocentric skills in orienteering, uh, i.e. stop using handrails and use more contour lines, a specific example? Um, so when we do, um, when, we, when we start learning in orienteering, if I go back to my slide, on the different, um, so the different groups here is we have the egocentric, allocentric, and procedural navigation. So because we can see that both of the higher skill level groups are pretty much always different than the controls or the intermediate, this does show that there is a little bit of a, a learning curve in orienteering in that, you know, a little bit is beneficial, um, but with more practice and more experience, you get, you get to um, learn those uh, more, more efficient navigational strategies a little bit better. Um, and then you see with the procedural navigation, with more orienteering experience, you start to uh, use those non-spatial strategies a little bit less. Not all females are uh, attuned to using procedural processing. It's just a, a general tendency. Um, but I think that if you wanted to try and um, develop these skills a little bit more, um, doing things like uh, visualizing uh, a map. So you're looking down at the map, you're in processing that information from a third person perspective, allocentrically. Um, and then when you are looking up, you are kind of, visualizing what you would see from the map in the real world. Um, and then when you say you traverse through that area, then you can um, look back onto the map, update that information to uh, the allocentric map reference. So I think it would just be a, a, a practice um, kind of situation, but uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question there. Um, yeah, and then like Jeff said, the the video games um, are kind of an accessible way to to do so. And um, there is even research if uh, catching features may not be exactly your thing. Um, there is a, there is uh, research showing that kind of first person video games um, may be stimulating different brain regions than uh, usually a third person or like, yeah, I guess third person video game. Um, there's research on Minecraft where uh, you can uh, build things and explore areas um, and that's really good at uh, stimulating cognitive function because you can also look at a map in that uh, video game. So um, is it innate or learned the allocentric difference? Um, I don't think, I haven't read specifically if there is kind of that uh, nature versus nurture. Um, I definitely think it would depend a lot on experiences and kind of exposure to um, things like maps and stuff like that. Um, it's kind of, uh, I think it would be highly related to um, 
things like uh, do you have like a very spatial kind of memory do you have which is kind of like a photographic memory um so I'm not quite sure if it's innate or learned I would say probably a little bit of both um but I haven't really seen a specific study that differentiates that oh yes in virtual though I forgot about that one I wonder where it was I think I've touched on all the questions that are in the chat here. Um, are there any other questions that I could answer before we wrap up? So I just have one other one. Yeah. Um, just curious. So of course, we're all very interested in orienteering and, and that kind of stuff. But it also sounds like there's actually, you know, a, some real benefits that could be taken out to the broader world, broader world. But I'm wondering if there's a long plans for longer term studies. To, on this just to follow somebody for a longer period of time just to see what that cognitive decline may or may not be yeah and I think uh we we had actually had this uh this I think study idea kind of thrown out on attack point by Jeff and you know following an orienteer from when they learn to when they stop orienteering or pass away but <laughs> uh, I think that would be a very long study considering we have uh you know the average orienteer might learn when they're a child and continue until they're 90 plus or something so um it would be really fascinating to to do that and to follow um follow kind of a, a cohort of orienteers uh across longitudinally but uh I think for now and in terms of uh costs and stuff I think uh, some of these uh cross-sectional studies where we look at different groups uh, across the lifespan um, there's a really great study um, in, done in Finland called the finger study, and they look at a lot of different life um, uh, variables, um, diet and nutrition and uh, exercise and stuff. Um, and that's a great longitudinal study where they show a lot of different factors on cognitive function in relation to dementia prevalence. Um, really, really cool study. Um, uh, our lab is hoping to do a training study for older adults. So um, how much does a uh, couple weeks of orienteering training in complete novices impact cognitive function for those uh, over, I think, I don't know what we're, we're planning on, but uh, older folks. Um, but uh, there's one thing just came to my mind and is completely gone right now, but uh, uh, it'd be really cool to see uh, also what exactly is happening in the brain of orienteers versus non-orienteers. So perhaps using like a electrode cap to measure brain activity and see what what parts of the brain are lighting up in uh, experienced orienteers versus non. Lots of ideas. So many. Well, if there's no well, more questions, I don't know if... Uh, anymore so, sounds like there isn't um so i, I just want to on behalf of uh, of orienteering canada um thank you emma for for the talk um and of course on, um Oops. from orienteering ontario as well um it was uh really interesting to um to hear from a different side of of your life emma and and <laughs> hear your uh your science brain talk um, they're very related my orientation <laughs> and my science brain <laughs> as you can see fair enough fair enough um but uh yeah at, at this point um I'd like to to take a minute to uh let everybody know that that Emma and all the rest of our athletes on the Team Canada program are uh currently uh kind of working on a fundraising campaign called Control Bounty uh, where throughout the month of May, uh, they are tracking the controls that they find, and we are encouraging um, orienteers and others uh, from across the country, around the world, um, to make pledges based on the, the controls that they're visiting. Um, so I've always thought this is a, a super fun uh, fundraiser, um, gives everyone a chance to Get as creative as uh, as you can and coming up with some interesting pledges. Uh, we have some some super interesting pledges so far. Um, I think Randy Kemp had pledged $2 uh, per novice course control that any of our Team Canada athletes visit. 
And if they can successfully complete the uh, the novice course without actually looking at the map beyond looking at it at the start, then that uh, two dollars per control becomes four dollars per control. Um, others have pledged a simple kind of ten cents per control up to a, a maximum. Um, and as I said, something something I've always found interesting. And as high performance director, uh, working with these athletes, knowing the uh, the amount of time and energy that they they put into training and to compete at, at world champs and, and the like, um, we would love to have uh, have everyone's support on that. So I'm going to send a link in the chat for that, and you can check out the pledges uh, that others have have put in. Think about maybe putting in your own pledge, if uh, if you can afford to to do that. We would really appreciate that. And again, thank you, Emma. Yeah, thanks, Emma. Awesome. I think, and Tracy, it, I'm not sure if you had anything else to add, but I think then we're good. We're, I don't know what the next one is on the schedule, but we will be sure to let you 